Our next speaker is Merrill Ward. Merrill Ward possesses the rare gift of exquisitely articulating deep esoteric wisdom, as well as transmitting this wisdom to those who work with him through imagery, mythology, ontology, epistemology, noetic experiences, and profound metaphor. He is deeply involved in studying and teaching the esoteric wisdom of the Western mystery school tradition and comparative world religions, and has done so for over 20 years. His work acts as a transformative catalyst for individuals and groups to gain a richer and deeper understanding of their power, creativity, and innate magical abilities, aligning them with their true mission and purpose in life. So let's give a welcome for Merrill Ward. Thank you. No, really, really, really. Thanks so much. How's everybody doing? Good. Everybody get some food in them? I hope. Yes, no, maybe so. Uh, I'm just adjusting my mic a little bit because I'm a little kind of up. It's kind of up high. Can you guys hear me okay? Awesome. I hope it's in the right place. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Merrill Ward. And I'm really delighted and honored to have been uh, asked to speak here at the Portland Psychedelic Conference for 2019. And I want to briefly thank my good friend, Leah Blackburn, for inviting me here today and to thank and honor the entire Portland Psychedelic Society team for making this extraordinary event possible. So let's please hear it for them. So my brief presentation today is entitled 5-MeO-DMT Entheogens, the Science of Spirituality, which hopefully you can all read. And it specifically is going to be focused on the subject of 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine and how this amazing molecule intimately links both science and the phenomenon of the direct religious or spiritual experience in some very unique and exciting ways. And hopefully, if I do not digress too much, which I have been known to do from time to time, we'll actually have a little time for Q&A at the end of the talk. So, let's begin. For millennia, and I'm hoping my clicker is working. Doesn't see, oh, there we go. For millennia, what today we refer to as the disciplines and systems of science and religion, or natural philosophy and theology, as they were more commonly known to our ancestors, they shared intimately intertwined roots that arose from a fertile soil of a common ground. It is historical fact that some of the most important aspects of what we now refer to as the scientific method were originally pioneered by ancient Egyptian, Mesopotamian, Greek, Hindu, Judaic, Taoist, Confucian, Buddhist, Hindu, Zoroastrian, Islamic, and Christian scholars, among any others that I may have missed. Um, in fact, it is the 13th century English philosopher, scholar, and alchemist, as well as Franciscan friar, Roger Bacon, who is cited as the father of the, psych uh, of the scientific method due to his empirical studies of nature. And it's really only been a recent convention within the last few hundred years, actually, that academia has sought to distance these two disciplines from one another. And yet, there has always been a natural and essential link between the two. And my clicker just really doesn't want to work. There we go. Just do me a favor, just pop this onto the chair and move it out a little bit, it might be better. Thank you. I love that piece. Uh, and as uh, Albert Einstein knew all too well, uh, as was cited earlier, the most beautiful thing we can experience is indeed the mystery. Today, modern science, especially in the fields of the neurosciences, is once again discovering the essential link that exists between science and spirituality through research into the realms of psychedelics and entheogens, and how these crystalline keys 
can effectively open our bodies and minds to deeper and more expanded levels of human consciousness and awareness. My presentation today will examine some of the critical links between these latest explorations into human consciousness using the scientific method to gain a deeper understanding of our innate spiritual nature. It's intimate connection to what I refer to as source consciousness and how direct spiritual experience can enhance our lives in a variety of ways. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar with this extraordinary and intriguing molecule, let me elucidate by providing you with a little background and overview. 5-MeO DMT is a psychedelic of the tryptamine class found in a whole variety of plant species throughout the world. And perhaps most notably in one species of amphibian, the Sonoran Desert or Colorado River toad, also known as the Bufo or Encilius alvarius. And perhaps even more intriguing than this is that this amazing molecule also exists endogenously in all mammals, including you and I right now. You are a 5-MeO DMT factory. Uh, along with its better known cousin, NN dimethyltryptamine, or DMT, one of the essential ingredients found in Amazonian ayahuasca brews. 5-MeO-DMT has traditionally been used by various indigenous peoples throughout both Central and South America, primarily as a psychoactive snuff, more commonly known as Yopo. And you can see these two gentlemen right over here partaking in the Yopo snuffs. The Yopos uh, snuffs come from these wonderful seeds right here. And then these are some other 5-MeO-DMT-containing uh, uh, plants, including Varola theodora, which is probably uh, the most, one of the most uh, active plants as far as that molecule is concerned. Let's see where we're going. Like other tryptamines, 5-MeO-DMT is an indole alkaloid molecule and has the basic same indole ring structure as DMT. So essentially, these are crystalline keys. They're little five-sided rings connected to little six-sided rings with various tails. So, we take in tryptophan, which is a simple amino acid. It exists in Turkey, it's what makes us tired at Thanksgiving, which we've got coming up. Our bodies then naturally convert tryptophan into tryptamine. It then adds a little oxygen atom right over here and becomes serotonin. Serotonin uh, and melatonin, two key indole alkaloids in our bodies. Now, some other important trip, uh, indole alkaloids, psilocybin, and NDMT down here, psilocin, and then here we have 5-MeO-DMT uh, that has the addition of a uh, methoxy group in the R5 position. It was first synthesized in 1936, then in 1959 it was isolated as one of the key psychoactive ingredients within Yopo snuffs. Now, within the body, 5-MeO-DMT acts primarily upon the serotonin 5-HT system with a particular binding affinity to the 5-HT1A receptor subtype, as well as trace amine receptors, and has been shown to have significant long-acting monoamine oxidase inhibition effects. 5-MeO-DMT is generally smoked or vaporized, uh, also encephalated. Its onset effects when vaporized are essentially instantaneous within mere seconds of ingestion, peaking from one to five minutes and lasting for upwards of 45 minutes depending on the individual ingesting. A low threshold dose can be from one to two milligrams while a moderate to strong or what we refer to as a full release dose of synthetic material can be anywhere from five to 15 milligrams inducing fully immersive transcendent states of unitive consciousness Thank you, Alex Gray. While officially placed on the DEA's Schedule One, you can boo now, thank you very much. Uh, in January of 2011, we call it Black Friday. Within the last several years, 5-MeO-DMT has begun being used clinically outside of the US, showing some success in alleviating depression, anxiety, and PTSD, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. It has also been successfully used as an adjunct to Ibogaine, Ibogaine addiction therapy 
to assist recovering patients with integration and is currently being looked at for potential future clinical trials here in the United States. Even more recent studies at the Dior Institute in Brazil have shown a clear pattern of results suggesting that 5-MeO-DMT may play a neuroprotective role in the human brain, as well as having significant anti-inflammatory and antidepressant capabilities while increasing levels of neuroplasticity. They've also, they've, this particular study, which has been on human organoids or these mini brains was actually showing a really dramatic increase in dendritic spine growth. So it's uh, pretty amazing what's happening. Also, some uh, additional important studies that uh, have recently come out of Johns Hopkins University. Uh, shows a, um, uh, and these studies were based on uh, patterns of use, motives of consumption, and acute subjective effects, as well as decreases in depression and anxiety among users, have also been released within the past two years. And we'll specifically be looking at two of these studies a bit later on, which our good friend Angela Ward, are you out there, Angela? Uh, uh, helped participate in uh, putting that data together. 5-MeO-DMT has been researched by several notable luminaries within the psychedelic movement, including Dr. Andrew Wheel, Wade Davis, Jonathan Ott, as well as the late Ralph Metzner in his book, The Toad and the Jaguar, and Stanislav Grof, who in his introduction to that particular work of Metzner's, suggests that further study and research of 5-MeO-DMT might prove promising in the treatment of PTSD uh, within war veterans and others. Within his seminal work, Tikal, renowned organic chemist and psychopharmacologist Sasha Shulgin, pictured there with his lovely wife Anne, listed 5-MeO-DMT as one of the only substances to induce what he referred to as a plus four experience. How many people here are familiar with the Shulgin rating scale? Eh, not everybody, so let's go over it. So Shulgin classified these in four distinct uh, categories. The plus or minus is the level of effectiveness of a drug that indicates a threshold of action. If higher dosage produces a greater response, then a plus or minus was valid. If a higher dosage produces nothing, then this was a false positive. So in both of these books, Tikal and Pikal, Tryptamines I Have Known and Loved and Phenethylamines I Have Known and Loved, Shulgin, along with his associates, crafted uh, a wide variety of these psychedelic medicines and then tested them on it themselves. And this was the rating they then used. So plus one, the drug is quite certainly active. The chronology can be determined with some accuracy, but the nature of the drug's effects are not yet apparent. So there's a sub-threshold dosage going on. Plus two, both the chronology and the nature of the action of a drug are unmistakably apparent. How many have been there? Um, but you still have some choice as to whether you will accept the adventure or rather just continue with the ordinary day's plans if you are an experienced researcher, that is. The effects can be allowed to a predominant role or they may be repressed and made secondary to other chosen activities. Now, the plus three, not only the chronology and the nature of the drug's actions are quite clear, but ignoring its actions, mm -mm, just no longer an option. The subject is totally engaged in the experience for better or worse. But the plus four is something unique, a rare and precious transcendental state which has been called a peak experience, a religious experience, divine transformation, a state of samadhi. Samadhi is the Hindu term. Sam means with, Adi means God, therefore samadhi, union with God and many other names in other cultures. It is not connected to the plus one, two, or three of the measuring of a drug's intensity. It is a state of bliss, a participation mystique, a connectedness with both the interior and exterior universes, which has come about after the ingestion of a psychedelic drug, but which is not necessarily repeatable with a subsequent ingestion of that same drug. Important to note. Now listen to this last line. If a drug or technique or process were ever to be discovered which would consistently produce a plus four experience in all, or let's say a vast majority of all human beings, it is conceivable it would signal the ultimate evolution and perhaps the end of the human experiment. Take that in for a second. 
That's a pretty bold statement to be making. And while some individuals, especially when utilized in an unsupervised or careless manner, have described 5-MeO-DMT's effects as utterly terrifying, revealing the darkest depths of the collective psyche, and yet, paradoxically, some have described these diverse effects as occurring simultaneously. 5-MeO-DMT has become increasingly popular within the underground psychedelic movement, especially for those seeking a singularly unique spiritual experience. This has especially been the case uh, through the writings of authors such as, oops, oh no, I know what I was gonna talk about. Uh, I misplaced my slides. So what 5-MeO-DMT has a unique ability to do, unlike many of the other classic psychedelics, is to completely dissolve the egoic function or has been referred to earlier today as, let's get it, the default mode network. What I don't think anybody has realized yet, <laughs> yeah, you're getting it. It's your demon. It is your demon. It is that constricted piece of consciousness um, that uh, Robin Carhart Harris uh, refers to as you know, being limiting and constricted. Whereas the psychedelics and entheogens are able to create what he refers to as entropic consciousness or vastly expanded consciousness that liberates the demon and changes it into your particular angel. Uh, so 5-MeO-DMT, um, as I mentioned, has become increasingly popular, especially through the writings of authors such as my good friend James Orock and his book, Tryptamine Palace. In addition to various books by my friend, uh, Dr. Martin Ball, including Being Human, my favorite, The Entheogenic Evolution, Entheogenic Liberation, uh, as well as other published works by psychedelic luminaries such as Stan Groff, When the Impossible Happens, uh, as I mentioned, Ralph Metzner's work uh, with uh, The Toad and the Jaguar, and most recently, Michael Pollan's New York Times bestselling book, How to Change Your Mind, what the new science of psychedelics teaches us about consciousness, dying, addiction, depression, and transcendence, where Poland chronicles his own experience with 5-MeO-DMT. How many people have read the book? A lot of you here. How many people have listened to the Audible book? So I really encourage, if you did not listen to the Audible book, listen to it in Poland's own words. It gives you a whole different view of it. Uh, and thus has increased the popularity of so-called toad medicine ceremonies, which is expanding exponentially and beginning to capture prominent media attention as it becomes more well-known to the general public. So this New York Post article just came out within the last month. This Daily Beast is not much older. And then you'll notice Johns Hopkins Magazine uh, just put out treating depression with a psychedelic found in toad venom. And we're gonna be talking about those two studies, uh, two of the several studies being put out through Johns Hopkins, which actually has to do with uh, synthetic 5-MeO-DMT, not the bufotoxin. And we can uh, have some Q&A a little bit later to determine the differences in those. As 5-MeO-DMT has been demonstrated to activate and release what Raja Yogans referred to as if my clicker would work. Wow, I guess I must need new batteries. Oh, there we go. Uh, what yogins refer to as kundalini shakti and consistently induce dynamic states of full nirvakalpa samadhi or union with divine consciousness that is beyond any doubt or description, thus leading it to be referred to as the crown jewel of entheogens, the god mole, and the god molecule. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you 5-MeO, DMT. You can applause now, it's an applause point. Thank you. So, my personal background is steeped in the study of comparative religions and a wide array of various spiritual disciplines. Uh, these include Raja Yoga, my long-standing meditative practice, Hermetic Kabbalah, the study of the ancient mysteries of both East and West, various tantric practices, as well as ceremonial magic, defined by the mystic Aleister Crowley as the art and science of causing transformation to occur in conformity with will. 
transpersonal alchemy as well, including esoteric physiology and psychology, as well as various techniques of theurgy, defined as working with God or source energy, and thaumaturgy, defined as the practical application of this God energy toward apparently miraculous means. And for nearly the past 30 years, my primary focus has been on attaining what I refer to as the mystical unitive experience, which has been described in many ways throughout many cultures, whether we want to call it samadhi, satori, moksha, dharmakaya, bodhi mind, Christ consciousness, God consciousness, the perennial philosophy, or however we may wish to describe it. It is that universal ground of being that is at the basis of all spiritual and religious philosophies that exist on our planet today. And one thing, if there is indeed one thing I've learned over the last decade, is that every religion that I have researched has either an exoteric or esoteric entheogenic practice associated with it, and usually some form of entheogenic sacrament is involved. So whether it is the Soma of the ancient Hindus or the Haoma of the Zoroastrians, whether it is ayahuasca and different uh, brews in South America, whether it is the Iboga of the Buiti, whether it is the Kaikion, ergotized barley beer of the Greeks celebrated at the Eleusinian Mysteries for over 2,500 years, there seems to be a connection with these entheogenic medicines and the rise of religion itself. Let's see where I'm gonna go now. So besides entheogenic uh, plant medicines and substances, there are numerous practices that have been taught and described throughout history for attaining these states of entheogenic union. And theo, God within, gen, to generate the God within, taken from the word genesis or the Greek genistai. So practices of Raja Yoga, which has been one of my meditational practices for close to 25 years, uh, laid out in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali in the fourth century, um, are specifically geared towards working individuals through an eight-step series of yama, control or discipline, niyama, self-control, uh, asana, physical postures, pranayama, control of the force through breath, pratyahara, watching the contents of the mind rise up into the conscious mind, dharana, which literally means concentration, dhyana, which is subject and object, and through that dhyanic trance, the union of subject and object, it leads into that state known as samadhi. And um, Raji Goa itself was brought into popularity in the late 19th century uh, in the West by Swami Vivekananda and popularized in Europe by British mystic and occultist Aleister Crowley. And again, that pinnacle of Raja Yoga is a state known as Nirva Kalpa Samadhi. Nirva Kalpa means beyond any kind of description whatsoever, an ineffable state of consciousness. Practices such as Shivite Tantraism and Kundalini Yoga uh, are said to also be able to bring the ardent practitioners into these states of Samadhic union or divine consciousness. Dao Oops, excuse me, I got ahead of myself, there we go. Taoist master, Montak Chia, speaks about light deprivation practices, being able to steadily bring about deeper and deeper altered states of consciousness by first uh, leading to uh, increased melatonin releases within the central aspects of the brain after just several days in complete darkness. As you get up to about a week in absolute total darkness, the, uh, the brain starts pumping out an NDMT, and then uh, according to some, after over 12, 13 days, can start producing uh, enough 5-MeO-DMT to bring people into these full unit of states. Various practices of bodily mortifications, uh, practiced by various mendicants and spiritual ascetics, such as the fakirs of India, the, as uh, Angela pointed out, the whirling uh, dances of the Darvesh of Persia, can be utilized to indu induce these deeper spiritual states of consciousness. I really like what's going on with this guy over here. He's like got his head completely buried in the earth. It's 
pretty awesome. <laughs> so um, I consider myself what has been termed a scientific illuminist. I do not believe these are mutually exclusive ideas at all. And a scientific illuminist, defined by British mystic Aleister Crowley once again, is the methods of science toward the aim of religion. And he basically, Crowley basically wrote all of this out in his big series of uh, this massive volume of occult literature entitled The Equinox. Um, and there he is right there. And Crowley, which a lot of people don't know, wrote extensively about drug use. Uh, not only his novel, Diary of a Drug Fiend, uh, which uh, documents uh, Paris in his time, uh, but also Roll Away the Stone, which contains several works uh, by Crowley uh, and then uh, published by uh, Dr. Israel Rigardi, his secretary, was all about uh, cannabis and hashish use. Crowley also translated all of the initial works of Baudelaire, talking about different states of inebriation. And you can even see that the Beatles not only put him, he's not only on there once, he's also somewhere, there he is again, right there. He's actually on Sergeant Pepper's twice. And um, in the 1980s, I worked at several after hours clubs in the Los Angeles area. And a gentleman who frequented one of those after hours clubs was this young man, uh, Timothy Leary. And I was very, very fortunate to be invited by Tim uh, up to his house in the Hollywood Hills for kind of mm, post-Saturday morning breakfast that we would go to once everybody kind of shuffled off uh, uh, Hollywood Boulevard. And when I was uh, having breakfast and smoking copious amounts of hash, um, I looked up and I saw Crowley's entire volume of the Equinox on Tim's bookshelf in his dining room. And I said, wow, Tim, I didn't know you were interested in Crowley. And he looked at me kind of askance and he said, have you actually read any of my work? Which I had not at the time. And so I kind of sheepishly went, no. But he was very, very kind. Um, and so, you know, not a lot of people knew how much uh, Leary was influenced by Crowley. Can we make sure sound is on, Neil? Because I want people to hear this because it took me a while to go find this. And I hope we can hear it. Let's see if this clicks it. Oh, we got no audio. Well, yeah, it's in. it is plugged in. Yeah, plugged in. Well, what I'll say, or if you can translate the Portuguese, um, <laughs> is he was saying, Tim was actually saying that he was incredibly influenced by Crowley, was following out his work, which is known as the law of Philema, which is do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, meaning giving ourselves self-agency to be able to conduct ourselves as independent, sovereign beings, and that that is based uh, on a foundation of love, or um, what Tony talked about earlier, agape. So these terms, thalima and agape, are still based on these uh, Greek ideas of the free will of the human being being based on the spiritual foundation of love. And I wish I would have the audio, but there you go. So let's see what I can do. Ah, here we go. Uh, even further, this was an interesting uh, study. Um, this is an essay by Dr. Benny Shannon, who is a professor of psychology at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And Shannon produced this article entitled, Biblical Entheogens, A Speculative Hypothesis. And Shannon uh, postulated, there he is with his two incredible books, Antipodes of the Mind and the Representational and the Presentational, which are probably two of the best books uh, on ayahuasca that I've ever read. They take quite a bit to go through. In Antipodes of the Mind, Shannon basically um, documented over 300 uh, ayahuasca ceremonies brought through by individuals, including 30 of his own. And Shannon postulated that based on the fact, uh, that, well, that when Moses went out into the wilderness and encountered the burning bush, uh, that the burning bush uh, instructed him to make all of the furnishings of this, the tabernacle in the wilderness, including the Ark of the Covenant, the altar of incense, and the table of shewbread, everything except the golden candlestick. So everything we see here, and that all of this was made out of what was called shatim wood, 
desert acacia. Desert acacia happens to contain some of the highest amounts of 5-MeO-DMT on the planet. So coincidence? I don't know. It's an interesting article, and I highly recommend that people consider looking at it. Now, not a whole lot was known about 5-MeO-DMT, really, until this pamphlet came out uh, in 1983, entitled Bufo Alvarius, the Psychedelic Toad of the Sonoran Desert, uh, by a very interesting uh, gentleman by the name of Albert Most. Obviously a pseudonym, right? Almost, not quite. Yeah. And this came out in the summer of 1983. It not only identified the Bufo Alvarius, the Sonoran Desert Toad, and had very beautiful herpetological um, uh, renderings, but then it also showed where the toad existed in the world. It also showed that it had these uh, glands, the parotid glands on the side of its head that could be milked and effectively produced 5-MeO-DMT along with over 100 different other alkaloids, including 5-HO-DMT, which is bufotenine, and a number of beta-carbolines. So um, the bufotoxin of the Sonoran Desert Toad, while it is the most organic form of this medicine, it's also the least pure, uh, with only about 15% of 5-MeO-DMT making up the complex compound. And so because it can have up to 75 to 80% uh, bufotenine, which is actually a cardiovascular constrictor, uh, you have to do much larger amounts. So as far as dosing is concerned, um, it's about a one to seven ratio. So one milligram of synthetic 5-MeO-DMT, if it's made really, really cleanly and purely, is equal to about seven milligrams of the bufotoxin. And so you have to do much larger amounts of the bufotoxin to essentially get the same effect. Um, let's see where we are. And uh, one of the things that I really like in this graphic is essentially the woman over here who's clearly under the throes of the 5-MeO DMT experience. Now, what I find to be one of the most intriguing facts about 5-MeO DMT is the fact that it exists endogenously inside you and I right now. We cannot say that for any other psychedelic or tryptamine. And so we naturally not only have the molecule itself in our bodies, we have the neurophysiology to be able to induce this full somatic experience. And that is, uh, that's pretty bold. Um, and so uh, about two years ago, uh, John Hopkins, along with my friend Alan Cooey Davis with the Source Research Foundation, uh, conducted a series of online studies. And they ended up in some of the latest reports from Johns Hopkins on this particular molecule, which I find to be incredibly intriguing. And so we're gonna drill down into two of these um, uh, two of these posters so we can really see what we're talking about. So here are the researchers that brought this forward, including my friend Joseph Berserglia, Rafael Lancelota, Roland Griffiths, and Alan Cui Davis, uh, entitled The Influence of Set and Setting on the Acute Subjective Effects of 5-MeO-DMT. So this is incredibly important because it shows how vital correct set and setting is Sorry, I'm having some pro issues here. That's working. Can you guys still hear me okay? Yeah. Great. How influential set and setting is, uh, especially with this particular medicine. So, uh, again, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine is a psychoactive indoalkaloid substance found in several pants, high concentrations in the bufo of various toad. Uh, please realize it is bufotoxin. It's not venom. I'm kind of technical here. Venom is something that's injected. Bufotoxin is something that is secreted. 5-MeO-DMT is also synthetically produced and elicits strong hallucinogenic effects with a rapid onset and a short duration of action. It should be known that both of the studies that I am referring to uh, both dealt with synthetic 5-MeO-DMT. 5-MeO has been used in various contexts, including recreational, <laughs> e.g. at home and music festivals, not recommended at music festivals. Just so everybody knows, that's a real bad idea. 
uh, and sacramental, e.g. shamanic and ritual settings. So for these particular studies, what we're going to find is that this was a very, very specific group of individuals who were using 5-MeO-DMT all in the same ceremonial setting. So research has shown that the set and setting of psychedelic experiences are critical factors associated with acute effects. Anecdotal evidence suggests that the same may be true for 5-MeO-DMT, however, we could find no empirical support for this assertion. Therefore, we sought to examine the influence of set and setting on the acute and persisting effects of 5-MeO-DMT. So what did they do? The aim of the current study was to examine the influence of set and setting on the subjective effects of synthetic 5-MeO by comparing individuals that have used 5-MeO, one, in the general population, and two, in this specific structured group setting in the Western United States. And this group uses very, very specific formats of um, uh, preparation, orientation, what they refer to as initiation, and then integration that's made available to everybody who comes through the particular group. So, using an internet-based advertisement, they, they recruited two samples of English-speaking adults to complete an anonymous web-based survey. Sample one included anyone reporting synthetic 5-MeO-DMT use within their lifetime. Sample two included members of the specific underground group who use 5-MeO-DMT in a structured setting in the US. This group guides the dose and administration of 5-MeO-DMT and the preparation and support during and following the sessions, which are similar to procedures used in laboratory studies with psychedelics. Measures included frequency of use, uh, mystical experiences using the MEQ that Tony referred to before, challenging experiences, persisting effects, set and setting variables. They conducted frequency counts, descriptive analysis of all study variables. So there was a total of 646 people who completed the online surveys. Uh, in the general population, it was 284 people. The mean age was about 34, 88% male, 88% white and Caucasian, about 80% heterosexual. In the structured group, mean age skewed 12 years older at 48. Uh, had 55% male, so almost half men, half women, very close. Uh, white and Caucasian, 84, a little bit more colorful, and 79% heterosexual, 1% more gay. I think it's significant. So unfortunately, you cannot see the numbers here, so I've produced them down at the bottom. The proportion of the sample who had a complete mystical unit of experience in the general population was 50% about half, but over in the structured group of 362, 83.4%. So these asterisks are showing that the statistical difference between these sets is dramatically higher. And so, um, let's see, where am I gonna go? And there it is. So the amazing parts of these findings is the significant statistics documented in this report. First, the survey included a group of 284 respondents and the from the general population compared to 362 in the structured group. This segment had a higher number of female respondents, over double than in the general population, and the median age range, as I mentioned, skewed 14 years higher. The significant findings are in the results pertaining to the responses given concerning what the study refers to as the complete mystical experience, which, which was determined by the revised mystical experience questionnaire, the MEQ-30, developed by Johns Hopkins team, adapted from the original questions created by Walter Penke for, um, uh, for the March Chapel experiment, using criteria based on a number of verifiable and anecdotal and scientific factors. Now, the general population group showed a fairly significant number, as I mentioned, 50% had experienced what they would define as the complete mystical experience, full nervicalpa samadhi. However, the structured group, utilizing liturgical and theurgical ceremonial methods, came in significantly higher at an astounding 83.4%, or over 33% higher, which clearly demonstrates the general format this particular group is utilizing in terms of pre-framing, preparing individuals for the experience, how they're creating what's referred to as a sacred container for the ceremony, the methods they're utilizing in administering their sacrament, holding space for individuals within the experience itself, as well as the materials, techniques, and support offered for integration and follow-up seems to be having a significant 
demonstrative impact in the positive results of the experience by their members over the unregulated or general population group. So that is pretty darn significant in my sense. If you drill down into the details, this includes significantly higher overall positive effects of the acute mystical experience, significantly lower challenging effects, significantly longer positive persisting effects, and a lower frequency of use within the structured ritual group. It's what, it's what I refer to, so it's not harm reduction, it's benefit optimization. It is not looking at something that is reactive, it is taking a proactive approach towards making the environment set and setting as absolutely safe and uh, secure and sacred as possible. So this is the mean rating of intensity of acute mystical experiences. I'm so sorry that these slides are uh, more than a bit blurry, but here on mysticism, we can see the rating is statistically significantly higher, positive mood significantly higher, uh, transcendence of space and time significantly higher, ineffability significantly higher. And then we move into the um, mean ratings of the intensity of acute challenging experiences. Isolation, significantly lower. Fear, significantly lower. Now you come over here and you get grief and death. It's a little bit higher, actually, which means that people were actually able to access their grief and express their grief in a more profound way. Physical distress, again, significantly lower. A sense of insanity, uh, much lower. Uh, again, uh, the idea of this uh, ego death experience was almost equal in both, uh, but a little bit lower. And then paranoia, it's almost off the scale and non-existent. So in his truly outstanding presentation entitled The Variety or the Variations of 5-MeO-DMT Mystical Experiences and Considerations for the Future, presented by my good friend, Dr. Joseph Bisserglia at last year's World Bufal Various Conference, uh, Joseph went in and he uh, really looked at all of these, uh, and Joseph was one of the researchers on both of these studies. He offered a detailed comparison, comparison of varied group samples reporting on the complete mystical unit of experience, which not only included uh, the two groups from this particular study, but also included statistics reported from their previous 5 meo study within the general population who used uh, the bufo alvarius toad bufotoxin, uh, as well as the well-known Johns Hopkins psilocybin research um, that uh, Tony again referred to earlier, and Dr. Bersergli's own research uh, survey from Bufa various recipients from the Crossroads Recovery Clinic in Mexico. So this graphic that's about to come up clearly indicates that the results from the structured group rank significantly higher than any research previously conducted and with a sample group that is significantly larger than almost any within this, certainly within this comparison and possibly on record. So check that out. You're talking about people who have used synthetic 5-MeO-DMT in the general population. Out of 284 people, 50% said complete, ineffable, mystical unit of experience. In the moderate to high-dose psilocybin uh, group with 18 people out of Johns Hopkins, 53%. In the high-dose range, 67%. Uh, this was the people who were using 5-MeO-DMT, the toad bufotoxin, in general population, up to 74%. Joseph Berserglia's study using 50 milligrams of uh, toad bufotoxin at crossroads within 20 people at 75%. But up here, 362 people using synthetic 5-MeO-DMT in the specific spiritual setting, 83.4%. So, uh, and that again was using the MEQ factors on uh, determining the complete mystical unit of experience. Um, that is higher than anything reported previously. So I, I find that fairly significant. Uh, the second study I just wanna look at briefly, entitled The Cognitive Effects of 5-Methoxy-Dimethyltryptamine Are Associated with Improvements in Depression and Anxiety. Couple of different people on the team, including Sarah So. Again, we have Rafael Lonsolota, Joseph Biserglia, Roland Griffiths, and Alan Davis. So here, a slightly different model. They used the same 362 people. Um, again, looking at what 5-MeO-DMT uh, can do. 
But the primary aim of the current study is to examine whether the use of 5-MeO-DMT is associated with spontaneous and unattended improvements in depression and anxiety among people who have used 5-MeO-DMT in the US with procedures, again, that guide the source, dose, and administration of 5-MeO-DMT and the preparation and support during and following the sessions. The second aim of the study is to examine the factors associated with improvement in depression and anxiety. So, the group that Hopkins was studying, they're not trying to improve depression and anxiety. Does everybody get that? In fact, I'm pretty familiar uh, that their intention is actually strictly to induce the nerva culpa somatic experience, to allow the individual to have this unique spiritual experience. So again, using the email distribution list, they were able to uh, gather this information from the group. Um, here now using depression and anxiety measures, the MEQ once again, the challenging experiences questionnaire and persisting ex, uh, effects questionnaire were all included. Again, here's the 362 with the same mean age. They uh, looked at college graduates, 75% of the people who participated in this group were college graduates. The rate, now, this was interesting. Of the 362 people that they looked at, they either had people self-reporting as having depression or anxiety or had been clinically diagnosed. So if you look at that, 173 people, that's essentially uh, close to half. Uh, so 50% uh, in each case, a little bit lower in the depression. But look at the improvement rates. When administered in a naturalistic group setting, 5-MeO appears to be associated with spontaneous and unintended improvements in self-reported depression and anxiety, which were related to more intense acute mystical effects and increases in rating of the personal meaning and spiritual significance of the 5-MeO DMT session. So take that in for a second. What the most important thing was that provided those reductions in depression and anxiety was the mystical unit of experience itself. Does so everybody get that? Um, these results are consistent with lab studies, found positive psychotherapeutic effects of tryptamines as an adjunct to supportive psych psychotherapy, which is referring to the psilocybin study, and suggests the importance of the acute mystical effects of psychedelic substances as one of the mechanisms by which they exert psychotherapeutic effects. So it's fascinating uh, in listening to uh, the doctor that was in the back talking about ketamine of the disassociative effects being considered as the anomaly. It's not the anomaly. It's actually what is creating uh, the, the lowering of the depression and anxiety. So um, so basically what we have is we have a decrease in depression by 81% and 79 as far as anxiety in this uh, population of 362 participants. I don't believe anything like that has ever been documented before. And if there's any clinicians in the house that can let me know of anything else, uh, I don't know. So again, 41% said anxiety, 48%, or I'm sorry, 41% with depression, 48% with anxiety. Symptoms were improved in 81% uh, with depression, 79% with anxiety. Unchanged, 17%, 19, and then worsened, 3% in depression, 2% in anxiety. So the indications showed that improvements in depression and anxiety symptoms were directly associated with the greater intensity of mystical experiences and higher ratings of positive beliefs about the spiritual significance and personal meaning of the 5-MeO DMT experience. So um, one thing I just wanna inform people about, there is a group online of anonymous, thank you very much, practitioners uh, from all over the world who have called themselves the Conclave. And they have developed uh, a best practices document, integration guidelines, and a full code of ethics. Uh, this is their, uh, uh, this is what they are devoted to. One, working within the awareness of the unified field recognizing the sovereignty of each individual within the unified field, the nurturance and well-being of all those we serve and to the co-creation of safe, solid, sacred, and secure containers for our work. Four, the safe, caring, compassionate, consensual, 
and responsible guidance of the individual through their preparation, initiation, and integration. Actively witnessing, supporting, and holding space and loving presence for the absolute entirety of an individual's process of awakening. Ensure and maintain absolute privacy, confidentiality, discretion, and respect in regards to the identities and specific personal processes of all those they serve, in addition to all those offering their service unless with their express permission. Continually developing themselves and their practice through honing their skills for the benefit of all they serve and the full empowerment of each individual in their own process of awakening. Supporting and challenging each other as practitioners in developing the highest quality and integrity of our service to all. Conscientiously receiving and giving feedback to their peers in an ongoing process of developing best practices and duty of care to best embody the shared vision, embodying the fullest expression of the totality of love. I think that's my favorite. And surrendering completely to the unfoldment of divine will and to remain t detached from the fruits of their individual endeavors. If people are interested in finding out more information on the Conclave, they can be reached at www.theconclave.info. I think I've got about 10 minutes for Q&A. And what I'd like to do is the mic holders, can you guys stand down here near the signs and people come up if you wanna ask questions? Or not. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Moving on, me, okay, cool. Yeah, Hi. go ahead. Um, so I am aware of um, a few practitioners of 5-MEO from the Mexican mm -hmm. uh, tradition, people in Mexico uh, yeah. administering. Yeah. And there's this almost like egoic, who's the, the greater shaman war kind of going on. Yeah, we've seen, we've seen this. It's, it's a little sad, actually. Yeah. I was curious if you could kind of speak to the, almost like the muscle rebuilding, the destruction of ego. Yeah, back and stronger. building up into the super if ego. You could, if you could speak to that. Sure. And also um, practitioners applying hape. Mm-hmm. Um, which can be deadly as it's yeah, occurred. Yeah, uh, absolutely then, uh, can. There's been, uh, there have been uh, deaths associated with uh, yeah. kind of irresponsible use of yeah. the sacrament. So to speak to that directly, thanks for, for asking. Um, so there are practitioners now with 5-MeO-DMT that exist all over the planet. Um, because the Sonoran Desert Toad primarily exists in the Sonoran Deserts of Mexico, um, there are a lot of practitioners who are coming out of Mexico and working with the, uh, the toad bufotoxin. Uh, while the medicine does have the ability to completely break down that egoic structure, just like you said, if it is not integrated effectively, it can build the ego back up into a super ego that the individual or practitioner is not even aware of. And so that can lead to kind of macho ideas about needing to be a bigger shaman or something to that effect. Um, and it's unfortunate that there have been some practitioners from Mexico who use uh, methodologies, I, I can't even call them methodologies, unsafe practices of blowing tobacco rustica up people's noses while they're in, in state, very, very dangerous. Uh, practices of like pouring water over people's faces to induce a breathing response, which I'm still not quite um, sure why that is or how that is. But these are incredibly unsafe practices to do. So why they're doing them, they've been misled. You know, I, I, I like to kind of look at it as positively I can, but when people are dying because of unsafe practices that are completely unrelated to the sacrament itself, um, I've got issues with that. So hopefully people will look at some of the work of the conclave and can see what um, safe duty of care and responsible practices with 5-MeO-DMT looks like because those materials are really, really clear. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Um, somebody over here. Hi. Um, I was more interested in the beginning of your lecture, more with the DMT uh, clinical trials with PTSD. And I was curious, there's been a lot of studies that show for anxiety, for PTSD, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But I'm more curious about how often they had to take doses and then how long before you started seeing a quality of life difference. Um, so that's a great question. As far as I understand from this particular study, uh, there was simply one to two doses. Uh, and uh, it's my understanding that people who utilize this, and this isn't, this isn't necessarily across the board, this is one study that was done of people responding in an online forum, right? So there needs to be a lot more clinical trials as far as I am concerned. Uh, but 
from an anecdotal point of view that I'm aware of, some people come in with deep, deep states of depression. Uh, they usually will come in uh, after titrating off SSRIs because it's not really safe to do this medicine with MAOIs or SSRIs. Um, and then after one to two experiences with the sacrament, that can just be gone for long periods of time. So people may need to come in once or twice a year, but it doesn't mean that adjuncts such as traditional psychotherapy cannot be effectively utilized with it, for sure. Yeah. So I'm interested in the method of uh, ingestion. Is it smoked? And number two, uh, is there a standard dosage that was used in these uh, trials and studies? So, great question. Uh, so it could be um, administered in a number of ways. Uh, most of the people that are working with 5-MeO-DMT now are either smoking it or vaporizing it. Um, it's my understanding that this group uses an argon gas piston vaporizer, which basically creates a chamber of uh, a, an airless chamber that's filled with argon gas, which is a noble inert gas. And then into that gas, the, uh, the 5 meo dmt is vaporized and then inhaled all at once. Um, so uh, the dosing protocols, there's one that was issued online that I am aware of. Uh, it basically uh, really depends on what a person's history is with other psychoactives. If somebody has little to no history with psychoactives or they know themselves to be incredibly sensitive, you wanna start with what's called a handshake dose, which is anywhere from two to five milligrams of the medicine. People have more practice with different psychoactives that can go somewhere from five to call it 12 milligrams, and this is all synthetic that I'm talking about. If somebody has a pretty deep uh, practice with entheogens and ayahuasca practice, peyote practice, um, done higher doses of LSD or psilocybin, that can go to 13 to 20 plus milligrams of the medicine, depending on the individual. Couple of things, uh, they figured that overdose range is about 60 milligrams. That's due to a book that's out called Darkness Shining Wild by Robert Augustus Masters, who was overdosed with 60 milligrams of the medicine, led him into having 18 month psychotic break where he would reactivate. So that's one of the things that can happen with this medicine, is it can cause reactivations to occur. And so uh, these reactivations, they're not quite sure where they're coming from, but uh, I'm pretty convinced it has to do with melatonin production out of the pineal gland in the corpus callosum, and that once somebody has taken this medicine, it's actually myelinating the neural pathways to be able to take us back into those states. And melatonin, which is very, very similar in uh, molecular structure, can re-trigger those pathways. So, um, but here's the good news. There's no LD50 dose range in humans for this medicine. So we do not know how much people can take. But what we do know is from the anecdotal reporting is that it's completely non-toxic. So that's the good news. Did that answer your question? And I believe in these studies, those dose ranges probably were somewhere from the five to 15 milligram range, more or less. Do I have more time or am I? Oh, uh, give me one second. Uh, well, let me get the question here. If people want to ask me about things like reactivation or activations, we can do so after. Yes, please. So I'm curious about the, um, the spiritual context of it and um, increasing access to, for people to be able to have these experiences. And I know that with um, some other natural sacraments like ayahuasca, there's mm -hmm. the possibility, the legal frameworks in place for groups to incorporate as a church or as a spiritual organization mm -hmm. and then you know, register that as a sacrament that that community uses and be able to use it kind of above board and legally. And I'm curious if there's any similar frameworks or if all of this is happening underground. Sure, I would refer to that as a vegetable bias. Um, you know, uh, and yet, uh, for example, the idea that you would legalize uh, a sacrament like uh, peyote or ayahuasca or uh, cannabis or psilocybin, but for some reason, this lab-made molecule is somehow different. That's what I mean by vegetable bias. So right now, there are only three organizations, spiritual organizations within the United States, uh, the UDVE, the Unio de Vegetal, the Santo Daime, and the uh, Native American Church. 
who have been granted exemption by the DEA to the Schedule I status of those medicines. That's it. And it's unfortunate. So by using what's known as the RFRA, or the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, that was put into place by Bill Clinton and Janet Reno. They actually did something right. Um, uh, so the, these groups have been using the RFRA to gain exemptions from the DEA. But I'll hold this. The Controlled Substances Act of 1970 that was put in place by the Nixon administration is an illegal act. It has been shown that Richard Nixon and Ehrlichman knew that they were marginalizing people of color by essentially associating them with heroin use, and they were um, demonizing the anti-war left by associating them with cannabis and psychedelic use in order to put the Controlled Substances Act onto the books in the first place, which then created the schedule and the DEA uh, as an extension of that. I will hold that the Controlled Substances Act itself was put into effect in an illegal context and needs to be completely overturned. <laughs> however, however, I do believe that we can resource the DEA from the Drug Enforcement Agency into the Drug Enjoyment Agency. <laughs> And so you have a DEA officer that comes up to you and says, hey, do you have any drugs? No. Would you like some? <laughs> right? And that this should not be, uh, on a more serious note, that this should not be a criminal issue, but it's a public health issue. Uh, it's what's going on in Portugal right now, for example, is what needs to happen. I'm getting the time out, but I want to thank you guys for being such a great audience. Thank the Portland psilocybin. Or the the Portland Psychedelic Society, and especially thank you for being carriers of your own medicine and liberation. <laughs>